everyone. I'm Diane Rasmussen Pennington, and um, I'm from the YouTube conference staff, and I'm also one of the presenters in today's se session. My co-presenter is Ingen Reuslin, and if you haven't seen our concast on her master's thesis on the presence of trauma and YouTube and the troubles, it's, it's on our YouTube channel as well when I interviewed her a few months ago. Uh, today we're doing a session together on the, the, the presence, the juxtaposition of light and dark, hope and trauma in a few songs that we've selected from Octane Baby. And first I'm going to play Ingham's video and then I'll do my presentation live and then we should have plenty of time for discussion at the end. So I'll go ahead and start the video now. Hi, I am Ingham and my part of the presentation I will be talking about four songs from the A side and one song from the B side of the album. I've named my um, presentation Kaleidoscopic Love um, due to the way in which you 2 uh, deals with love in these lyrics. Um, and they write about love in a very ambiguous way. At the time of the recording, um, instability and, and gloom pretty much re uh, ranged both within the band regarding uh, musical uh, fr um, fractioning uh, and also in the outside world and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Gulf War going on. In my um, piece here, I will be um, drawing upon the theoretical frameworks that I applied in my master's thesis on U2 and the troubles and trauma, um, drawing then above all on Hirsch's notions of meaning and significance, as well as Tambling's notions of allegory. And last but not least, also this time I will be applying um, trauma theory when digging into the lyrics. Uh, as I see it, the meaning of, of most of the songs uh, seems to be influenced by what was going on both inside and outside at the time of the recording. Um, and um, there are direct or indirect references to, to the edges, marital breakup and um, and uh, when it comes to significance, I would say that all of these lyrics um, are as applicable today as they were uh, 30 years ago, because it will hurt as much today to lose a beloved one, to go through loss as it did uh, back then. The first song that I will be addressing is Who's Gonna Ride Your Wild Horses? A tale, as I see it, of abandonment and jealousy and also ambivalence that goes with tra trauma. Um, and in the opening lines, we meet a speaker who is experiencing loss. He And uh, questions of replacement ring out throughout the lyrics and the speaker is um, asking his interlocutor questions like who's going to ride your wild horses who's going to drown in your blue sea even asking and exposing sexual jealousy asking who's going to taste your salt water kisses um, the reason why I mentioned ambivalence has to do with the way in which the speaker addresses his interlocutor, applying terms like baby and love, and even asking um, his interlocutor, baby, can we still be friends? And here in this lyric, I do find religious allegory above all in the lines, hallelujah, heaven's white rose the doors you open i just can't close here i see 
submission to God's will, to God's moment, if you like, if you apply the biblical prism, and the notion of time, um, the notion of kairos, you know, uh, rendering yourself to God's will. And when it's time for God to open a door, nobody can close that door. The next song I've been looking into is Love is Blindness. And here we are facing dark trauma. Um, the speaker um, states in the opening lines, love is blindness. I don't want to see, won't you wrap the night around me? There are elements of escapism here and seems to me like the, the speaker wants to escape reality and not to face what is going on. And this choose, uh, this choice, sorry, I mean, to, is to, um, to choose blindness over sight might turn out fatal. Um, and um, the descriptions of, of love, in these lyrics is, as I see it, very dark. It compares love to, to clockworks and steel, this mechanical feeling of, of, um, of and no tenderness. Um, and uh, here, the speaker, um, in a way, seems to be the, the first victim witnessing uh, his interlocutor committing adultery or um, in a parked car in a crowded street is your love made complete might also lead to prostitution um, and the darkest part here I find the darkest trauma is the description of love as drowning in a deep well all the secrets and no one to tell and, and to me this is a reference to domestic abuse, the feeling of being caged, of being um, stuck, uh, not getting out, um, and um, it, it's dark trauma, and you're not able to breed, uh, you're being suffocated, uh, both physically and also psychologically. So a little light in here, um, and uh, this um, uh, uh, reference to domestic abuse is even more obvious, um, it seems to me, in So Cruel. Um, here the speaker experiences uh, trauma again, um, stating that we're cut adrift, still floating, but um, there is also this uh, notion of ambivalence. Um, the speaker uh, says, oh, sweetheart, you're so cruel. And this juxtaposition of the word sweetheart and, and cruel um, in a way uh, tells me that um, there is this ambivalence. And this is uh, very common in in, in trauma, traumatic or abusive relationships because you, you, you um, or yeah, you would uh, in a way doubt yourself. Uh, and I think self-blame is also part of, of that. So here there is this bewilderment. Um, there are traces also to, to a religious allegory in which the speaker likens the skin of his interlocutor to God's only uh, dove, um, connoting purity and sacredness, um, maybe light hope, then also in the midst of darkness. As we shall see, uh, betrayal uh, and loss um, is not only um, something that is part of an intimate relationship, it could also um, occur um, other places like in biblical figures. Um, and this is the song from the B-side, Salome, um, drawing upon the biblical story of Salome, King Herod, 
and Salome's mother, Queen Herodias. So we're here at the at the castle celebrating the king's birthday and Salome is dancing in front of the king. Um, and there are parallels with, with the Bible uh, and, and Bono's lyrics. Um, and the king, he is so enchanted by her dancing that, that he says to her, I will give you whatever you want. Um, and what did she want? Well, as we all know, she didn't ask for money or jewelry or anything like that. She went straight to her mother's for advice and, and her mother told her to ask for John the Baptist's head, the head of the John the Baptist. And um, the reason why she would want that is that this is a tale of trauma, yeah, and, and also of revenge because John the Baptist, he didn't approve of the marriage between King Herod and Queen Herodias because she used to be married to the king's brother um, and he had said this is not okay and because of this she hated him but the king he liked the holy man and, and it says in the bible that he felt exceedingly sorry that um, Salome should ask him uh, for this um, also in, in the lyrics here in, in U2's song uh, the king the speaker says baby I feel sick don't make me stick to, to the promise, but you had promised her uh, and uh, it had to be done. Um, and so this was um, a collective uh, trauma, one might say. Uh, they were all witnessing this. Um, and there's also a lot of trauma in my, in my last uh, analysis. Um, the song Ultra Violet or, or Light My Way, even though light is a part of the title, um, there are uh, a lot of evidence, there is a lot of evidence of tra trauma here. Um, and it seems to me like uh, it's, this is a modern elegy in, in some ways, it's an immersion in loss. And um, the speaker here even states the day is as long as the night is dark and I'm in the dark, I can't see or be seen. Um, so this is this is really dark. Uh, he even states and admits that he feels like trash. Um, so that is pretty gloomy. Um, but at the same time, he confesses to his interlocutor that you make me feel clean. And the be most beautiful lines from this song, I find this, are the lines, uh, as you probably all know, um, these lines, uh, your love is a light bulb hanging over my bed. And um, in this song, uh, I, I find a lot of, uh, yeah, allegory, digging underneath this allegorical veil, I'd say that. On, on the one hand, you might interpret um, this light as, uh, as an intimate partner, um, a friend maybe, um, and um, at the same time, you, you might say that, uh, look into another layer and uh, even interpret the light as being uh, Christ himself in the gospel. Uh, Jesus says, I am come a light to the world. Yeah, I am the light. I've come a light to the world so that the world will not abide in darkness. If you believe it on me, you're not going to abide in darkness. Um, and um, there are some references in some of the lyrics also to, to the hidden treasures and then that drawing upon, upon the sound tradition that uh, God will give you treasures uh, in the dark. Um, and when, when uh, dealing with these things, um, Bono is not alone in a way. He is drawing upon, as I see it, old hymn traditions, like the hymn Lead Kindly Light that was written about 250 years earlier. Uh, so both uh, in this hymn and, and in, as in Bono's uh, lyrics, uh, the speakers are experiencing experiencing the same 
um, trauma and also in a way the same search for for light and the belief that over more in hand as it says in the in the hymn um and and over the bed there is this light there is you're not let alone in in all of your pain and um this light then <clears throat> that has probably then guided you to for led the way for you too for for the last decades might also then be an inspiration and, and help to us uh, today. Um, and if applying, when applying the biblical prison then, um, believing that, one might say that there's always grace, and there's always love hanging over your bed. And no matter what gridlock you're stuck within, no matter how difficult it is, there is always light to be found amid dark trauma. Thanks, Ingen. I really love the way you ended that. It's just so pretty. <laughs> okay, we'll get up my presentation now. So for, for my part of the presentation, I looked at the same songs and I'll kind of present them in the same order, but with a very different approach to analyzing them. So I've named my half of the presentation Beneath the Moon and Under the Sun, which is a, a, a line from Night and Day. And I just think it's, it's so uh, reflective to me of the different ways that we're approaching dark and light, trauma and hope. And I think that probably my part of it uh, reflects more on trauma, not as much on trauma, but more on the light and the dark. Uh, that picture, by the way, is one that I just pulled out and scanned yesterday. That was me in uh, 17th of April, 1994, as you can see by the highly advanced um, software, hardware, and menswear down there in the corner. Um, that was me, and that, that was two years after I saw Zoo TV, and I was still wearing my t-shirt, and I, I think I was at a party at university at the time when I was wearing it. So I just kind of thought I would throw that in. So my methodology uh, compared to Ingen's approach to looking at the lyrics uh, and how they reflect trauma and, and light and dark and hope. Uh, mine is based on a lot of how I, I do a lot of my, my other research, which is looking at not just the text of something, but also the music, the video, the surrounding um, elements, the, the music itself, the, what people say about it, what people do when they interact with it. And, and the, the best term that we have for this approach now is multimodal discourse analysis. So for those of you who aren't academics, and uh, I wouldn't expect everyone here to understand what that means, it's just a way for people to analyze different kinds of communication to go deep into finding the, those connections. And especially with the approach of intertextuality, which if you read my paper that's listed below there, uh, that's the first time when I was trying to play around with this method, which is looking, at, which looked at how people express emotion and cover versions of the U2 song, some, song for someone, mainly around their emotions of how they how they uh, play the song, how they create videos for the song, or the comments that people make on the cover versions that people have created. So I'm taking a similar approach here to looking at these songs and things related to them. So I think in the, I, it was interesting because I started looking at the U2 and I, Anton Corbin book, uh, as, as you some of you will know, I'm a huge Corbin fan as well. And it, whatever you think of Bill Clinton, I thought he had an interesting comment in the beginning of the book where he wrote a little introduction and he wrote, the psalmist said, make joyful noise before the Lord. And Bono has done just that. And I like that term joyful no noise because it does make a lot of sense, especially if we're looking at dark and light and trauma and hope and how they relate together. So just to give you a little bit of the visual context of what Corbin was doing for them uh, for the album, of course, we all know the trip, the, the cars. The, the one on the, the left was the Falstaff restaurant, which was the restaurant associated with Hansa Studios. So if you just imagine them going in there for, you know, a pint after a, a long night of recording or something, I don't know. Uh, and the one on the right, I think was very iconic. And, and Corbin talked about how this was very much a, he saw that as a leitmotif or, you know, constant symbolism throughout Octane Baby. And what's interesting to me about that photo is that the, the, the car is, is obviously, it's so colorful, 
But then if you look around it, it's very dark. It's very what I would think of as you know, post-war Germany uh, with the, the sort of the dark weather and the, the, the winter, uh, the leaves off the trees and everything else around it. But then there's this, this spot of light in the midst of this relatively dark scene. So in 1991, when they started working on producing the rest of the album, they went to Morocco and Corbin created a whole bunch of photographs there in color. And they saw these as the basis for the Octon Baby co cover. So we all know uh, Adam's photo here. I chose the censored version in case any of you have little kids walking around you or anything like that. Uh, but what was interesting about how they took this photo of Adam was uh, Corbin used a handheld flashlight in complete darkness. And that was how they created that light and dark uh, scene with flashlight and darkness all around him. And also interesting to note, uh, historically, if you it said in YouTube by YouTube, and I actually didn't know this myself, was that Hansa Studios was previously an old SS ballroom. And they talked about how the, it felt very dark and gloomy and depressing and how people, um, you could almost sense that, that feeling in there. And so it might not have been, you know, the lightest place to produce an album, but somehow I still feel like they managed to get light out of that darkness. So first with um, the videos for Who's Gonna Ride Your Wild Horses, the, it's interesting, I don't, I don't know why, uh, probably Shara or some other people here would know why they used a slightly different version of the, the song for the video compared to what was the original version of the album. And it, it was interesting as well that um, I was reading all about how there was a lot of different remixes at first. And it, it to me, this is actually my least favorite song on the album for some reason. I know some people love it, so no offense if it's your favorite song, but maybe there's just something about it just didn't work. And that kind of came, made sense to me when I was reading about the, the, what they tried to do to get these sounds kind of putting them together, trying to basically, it was a demo that never, in their opinion, according to the band, never really went anywhere uh, with all the different remixes they tried. And, and uh, there was a quote from uh, in Flanagan where he was commenting about them trying to work on this song. Banu keeps trying to make something out of a track called Who's Gonna Ride Your Wild Horses that the others would just as soon toss in the toilet. <laughs> um, and it just, for me, it never came alive, but there's a lot of really nice uh, descriptions of you know these different sounds that are put together in the Katanza Wright book. And the video from the song, there were those, like color scenes of, of Zoo TV because they were already on tour when this video was made as well as these black and white versions of band and if you look at their expressions, they all look kind of not only in black and white, but just kind of pale and just generally sort of not terribly impressed with things. And I thought that was an interesting contrast with when they had the, the color and the light versions of, of the, the tour. So Cruel never had an official video, which of course made my analysis a bit more difficult, but it, this was from the, the version of the Bono's acoustic version of from, uh, from the sky down. And again, you see these, this imagery as well, even his expression when he's playing uh, the, the darkness, sort of the brownness of the room, that it's not terribly light, it's not terribly um, inspiring or cheerful. And it, you, you, always, you also see as well that the, what, what happened was when they, it was originally an acoustic track and the, they went ahead and sort of played around with it and mixed it a little bit and they kind of re-engineered it and put different parts of things together. And so it created a very different feel to the music itself. And I like what Katanzarite said, well, there's like a change of key in the middle of it, right? And it, it kind of lifts you up in the middle according to his interpretation of it. He said, it lifts everything up without destroying the sacred sorrow. This is immediately followed by one of the most powerful and harrowing guitar solos ever recorded, anguish and torment, magnified by the presence of divine love, the moment that sorrow begins to be transformed into joy. Love is Blindness is another one that did not have an official video. It was not released as a single, but we do have a few things that we can look at here. Uh, this was Edge's version of Love is Blindness in From the Sky Down. So again, we see there's a light off in the distance. I kind of like this, this particular screenshot because you see the light that's over him in the room, but the rest of everything else is still kind of dark. If you look at the photo of him playing 
on the, uh, the upper right, you see there's a light bulb. Um, it's not over his bed, but it's over his chair. And uh, he's, you can see again, his expressions quite serious, but there, there are all these little bits of light around him. And one of the, there's a seven minute version of Love is Blindness, which was from the 2007, what's it called? The baby release of Octane Baby in 2011, 10 years ago. And I was listening to this again on YouTube and I just really liked that comment. <laughs> Holy shit, this version is amazing. Where did you find it? And then they went into a discussion about it. But at the, uh, Again, the imagery here, the black and white photo, Bono wearing the horns, but he's he, he's holding his hands in prayer position. And then the other three standing behind him wearing sunglasses. And so again, there's, there's more of that contrast. This is where it gets really interesting to me with Salome. So my impression of this is a bit different from what uh, Ingen presented, not that, what, because she kind of felt like she didn't find much light or hope in Salome. But let me explain why I think it's there, uh, in my opinion. That, so the, the video was filmed in Morocco in 1991 at the same time when they were making the photos for the, um, the uh, album cover. And there was a lot going on at the same time when this was happening. So there was the Mysterious Way song, there was the uh, Oscar Wilde's play Salome, which I read, you can read about that in the Flanagan book that Bono had seen it, he had liked it. And so we don't know really what inspired him to do that from there. But at the same time, it, in Berlin, there were performances going of Richard Strauss's dance of his, his opera Salome, and specifically the dance of the seven veils, which is what, where Salome is actually playing out that scene that, that marked 622 in the Bible, where she's dancing for King Herod and he was pleased and he was happy about it and all these things. And, and so it was um, interesting there because of the veils. We see that this was a photo from Morocco, the women who are veiled, who are just women who live in Morocco. Uh, we see the comment on the, the seven and a half minute or eight minute remix of Salome, the Zeromancer remix. Somebody commented on that on YouTube. This is one of YouTube's best songs ever, so very sexy. And then we see, uh, you see Bono dancing with women frequently. That was from I think the INE tour where he was dancing with a girl in Paris. And then I just pulled a screenshot here from the dance of the seven veils being performed as part of the opera. And you actually see there King Herod watching with Salome is covered up with seven veils. And traditionally, when the dance of the seven veils is performed in an opera, depending on where they are at the time, Salome sheds all seven veils uh, to the point to where she's wearing nothing at the end. And depending on where they are in time and you know, how, how, um, how, how uh, progressive and open people are about those kinds of things, she may not shed everything, but traditionally that's the way that they wanted it to be performed. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And so the interesting part of, I guess philosophically from here is the book chapter in uh, Mark Bradlaugh's book called uh, about existential, ex existential Christianity uh, in his book, YouTube Philosophy. And he wrote that the, the title of Mysterious Ways alludes to a hymn by William Cowper called Light Shining Out of Darkness. And in that hymn, it says, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. So obviously you two change that word God to she. And there are some people who, you know, they talk about Johnny. It, Johnny's like the first person he mentions in the song, but, so John the Baptist, talking about him living underground. And if you watch the Salome performance uh, in, the, in the opera, they do per, per show him you know, sort of being underground. And he only comes up when Herod orders his severed head to be delivered to Salome on a silver platter. And so, but you two is suggesting in the song potentially that by being underground, he's running away from love and that possibly love and grace, whether it's a woman, whether it's from God, whatever it is, maybe that is something that could help him come up from the ground and, and lift him up. So then uh, we have here um, ultraviolet and a couple of different versions here. So this, this was from the, the uh, Joshua Tree 2017 tour where, um, it, there's a lot of interesting stories about different versions of ultraviolet, but this one was the one in where the, the, in the beginning that Corbin screen that's in the back, it starts out as the word history and kind of morphs into her story. And then it goes into the women of the world where they're showing that there's the band performing in the center panel 
And then the panels on either side of them, are, they're showing famous women in history that, or history that did amazing things. And it, it's just very uplifting. It really gives a different feel to the song to, to see that, I think. And of course, we have to go back to the, the 360 performance. And don't forget to make the fizzy, the fizzy grape stack uh, later on today with our, with our chef, who's going to make the ultraviolet grapes. Uh, but really here, I think this is a very important part of, of this song because of the, you know, the, the microphone being the sort of this beacon of light. And Bono uses it to kind of swing around from it. And it, it talks a lot about um, some of the things you can read about it, that he's sort of floating around and finding things. And it, it says, you know, when Katanza Wright talks about this very nicely, where he says, it, it, then it happens to an avalanche of drums and the clean propulsive jangle of an angelic guitar, his heart bursts open. So is that microphone his heart? Is it something else? The soaring voices of angels on high proclaim a loud celestial hymn as a prodigal son turns his heart toward home. All those who seek God will find God, for God came looking for us first. And I just think that's a very beautiful thing. And so you see the light from above. There's a, the disco ball, which is oh, sort of in the lower right. Um, so is that, you know, what, what is going on there? Is that the light bulb over his head? Or is it he's clinging to the microphone? Uh, Nicholas Greco in his book, The Rosary, The Microphone, suggests that it reminded him of McFisto and him dancing around with microphones and other things in the, the Zoo TV tours. So just to sum this all up, uh, between what Ingen worked on and what I worked on with our two different approaches, uh, we kind of found both trauma expressed light and dark in these songs, but also the hope of finding light in times of darkness. It is possible this hope may have lit the way for you two first and then their listeners for the last 30 years. Certainly has for me. From a religious and a spiritual perspective, the motif of finding light and darkness can be associated biblically. And I have a quote here from the Bible. Yeah, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And even when darkness strikes, there's a promise that we are not left alone in this. In Isaiah 45, 4b, we learn that God will, quote, lead you to bury treasures, secret caches of valuables, which is uh, from the message, meaning that we will be given bright spots to illuminate the darkness, just as the lighthouse splits the dark. Thank you very much. So we are happy to take questions or um, discussion or thoughts on anything, if you have any. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Ingen, do you have, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have anything, because I know you haven't seen what I what I worked on. So do you have any response to how my part and your part kind of work together at all? I'm really happy about it and I really liked it. And I uh, have to say, I'm so glad you invited me onto this project. Uh, and uh, also glad that you included those uh, verses from the Bible at the very end. And I think that, and I'm also so happy that you found some light in Salome, and, and um, now I see see the light myself, if I can say that, because of the, yeah, what you said there, and I think it worked nicely together, and, and I'm really happy about the different approaches, uh, in a way, underlining both, you know, the the gravity of trauma, but also, you know, the power of, of the light, in a way, so, so it really, I'm really drawn to this topic, and very happy about it so so yeah you know, the 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 whole uh, the dichotomy of light and dark you i think this band has played with that for almost their entire career especially in live in live situations mm -hmm. right like lighting it ha has always been a big part of u2's um staging w whether it's been on a small club stage or in a big stadium so uh thank you for um so for for pointing out the the lyrical and musical uh, <clears throat> light and dark because uh, I think it's it, it, it ties in um, very, very very deeply with not just the album but also the the, the live experiences.
Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I guess this is a good time to show everyone. I have a, a light bulb tattoo on my uh -huh. um Mark and I were talking about this earlier. Um, but I, I got that after the uh the, before I saw the I and E tour and I realized the light bulb was meant it was gave me a lot of light at you know all of their music and everything that it's done for me personally at times when I've really struggled in my life and their light bulb has always been there for me. And I think that's true for a lot of fans. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was hopefully one of those things that I, one of those ones that I won't regret later. <clears throat> I'm still happy with it. <laughs> and I, I, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had a question. I, um, sorry, I, I think somebody else was gonna ask one, but, um, do you, could, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about um, your thoughts on how songs that have such trauma in them become um, hits and popular and, and people have a great time enjoying an album that really does have a lot of very disturbing <laughs> you know, material on it. Um, does that, does it upset you? Do, do you find it um, actually, maybe you know, helpful. Um, are you are you kind of happy about that? You know that there's there's this just huge fan base out there for very upsetting and disturbing music. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, um, I to me at least, I, I find it helpful because, as Diane pointed out, I mean, it helps me in times of, of struggling and. Um, and I think that what is so cool about the lyrics uh, is that they are applicable for people over time. So it's it's as relevant today as it was at the time of the recording. And I mean, even in earlier days with the old hymns that people were, you know, struggling with trauma and searching for light. So in a way, I found it comforting myself. Of course, one would wish that there was no dark, but... Um, but there is and and then i find it um yeah comforting and um and also cool that such you know heavy lyrics might also turn out to be hits i have to say that at the time when it the album was released i i didn't catch up on all of this i think especially it was the sound the new sound this industrialized industrialized sound <laughs> in a way i didn't i couldn't relate to that because i was starting out being a fan in the beginning of the 80s, uh, clinging on to, to war and Gloria and all of those things. And I felt a little bit estranged uh, at this point, but now going back, looking into, into it and after doing my master's on trauma as well, I have to say it's, it's so uplifting and to find hope. I mean, like in the midst of the darkness and as, um, Greg pointed out yesterday, I mean, like God is in the rubble and, and, and I, I would say, yeah, he, he definitely is. And, uh, and the image of the light bulb as well. I mean, and the different layers also inspire me a lot. So, so yeah, my, my answer is, I, uh, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. You feel like, you feel like a lot of people kind of miss the point though, about some of the music and, uh, is there is there maybe too much enjoyment of the music, but not enough? You know, and, um, I don't know. Do you take it sort of on as a personal mission in a way to try to educate people about, hey, there's some trauma here in the song that you're dancing to. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I I don't meet a lot of people with whom I can discuss these things. I mean, like my mother is my my main support <laughs> supporter. Yeah, she's supportive of this, and, and I have. Yeah, of course, my supervisor, and it's, it's great. I mean, people in general, I mean, they, I don't know if they're, first of all, that many YouTube fans where I live, uh, some at least, but, but, but I, I don't know. It seems to me that there, there is too little stress on, on, you know, lyrics, but my whole life I've been very interested in, in the lyrics and always find find comfort in, in in good lyrics and heavy lyrics and and i mean to me uh, bono is very inspirational the way he writes it mm. the way he puts in um religious allegories and and i really love the lines heaven's white rose the doors you open i just can't close and i think it's 
I think it's time, like Stuart Bailey said, I think it was yesterday, to, to really look at Bono as a, as a writer and what he's doing. And, and mm -hmm. of course, you too as a, as a band. So, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, people, or we, we need to, to look closer to that, not just the music. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, if I could ask, um, thinking about people who are experiencing trauma or who have lived through trauma and then they come to an album like this or any album that meets where they've where they've felt, um, what do you what would you say about the balance between the need to just kind of immerse yourself in artistic expression that is the darkness that is that acknowledges that there is darkness and there is despair versus than also having the answer that there is also a light. And because I've always heard Octane Baby as more of the darkness than the light. And so this presentation was really helpful for me, but I don't know, is there, as humans, like there is an extent to which it's good to just acknowledge that it's hard and without having the answers yet. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very good question or reflection there. Um, not sure what to say, but but I I think uh, that it's a good um, with, with both because um, if you if you just uh, cling to, to the to the dark side, I mean that will I mean you you will drown definitely in in this deep well. So so I think that it's uh, the way Bono writes. Um, he describes life, and and I really like that 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 he also points to the light because if not, I'm not sure if I could cope. So, so, um, but I'm not sure if, yeah, if I'm answering it. Uh, what do you ask there? But, but um, I think both things are, are important. And, and in an interview, I saw Bono talking about um, the sounds um, and, um, and th this brutal honesty uh, in which uh, the Psalms address, uh, I mean, issues of life, there you also find light and darkness. So I'm, I'm, I'm really there. I'm not just like, I can't just say hallelujah all the time and just like <laughs> forget about the dark. And I wish I could, but, but I like the fact that, that both sides, both the dark trauma and the light hope um, are included in the lyrics because I, to me, uh, it, it mirrors life, life as it is. It's like, uh, you know, it says in one of the lyrics here on the album, fingers, you know, he you know, head in heaven, fingers in the mire. So of course I would like to have both fingers and head in heaven, but not, it's not like that. <laughs> so yeah, so, so I, I love, I love this, both aspects, yeah. Find it important as well. Going back to the stage settings, and the lighting, the, the bulb hanging down over the chair sort of, sort of signifies to me further inspiration. Because, you know, when someone gets an idea, a light bulb comes on. So that could have been a metaphor for them saying that we need to get more inspiration for further material. So let's have a light bulb. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but that was an idea which came to my head, but just an idea, just an idea. You know, the, I, yeah. I, this, 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 again, this, this dichotomy of light and dark mirrors the, mirrors the dichotomy of hope and, and, and trauma. And, you know, U2 sings a lot, sings a lot, has a lot of songs about heavy stuff, but what I hear and what I read in their lyrics, there's always an underlying sentiment of hope. Always, no matter how how dark the main subject matter is, there's always, in my ears, an underlying sense of hope and an underlying sense of no matter how bad it is right now, there's always the potential for it to be better. And I think nowhere is it more evident, that dichotomy, than on Octung Baby, because the surface of it and the very deep surface is all, it, it's dark, it's betrayal, it's irony. Yeah. But... Um, there is hope on this album. Um, you you might have to dig for it in a lot of places, but it's always there because it's because it's U2's music, and and in my ears, that's 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 one of the things that I love best about it is no matter no matter how serious or heavy or dark the primary subject matter is, Bono's always there, but saying yeah yeah yeah, it's dark, 
But if you keep working, keep digging, there's always potential for it to be better. Mm. That's a great comment. I really love what you said, and also what AD said. It's, it's great, um, and and it is. This is what I cling to myself, and I, I really, you know, immerse in those lyrics because uh, we need hope. Uh, if not, we would might as well lie down and <laughs> never to get up. So so I, I and I think also with Bono's history. Um, you know, it's not just words, it's not just something that he says, he knows about stuff, he knows he has experienced the, the tragic loss of his mother, he knows that life is hard, and um, he also felt, uh, as I've read about, that that's the, the divorce, um, an edge divorce, that was one of the saddest things, so he comes out to me as a person who, who cares and who understands that it's not a quick fix, um, and and I like the way he talks about life. He's honest, and and I I can totally relate to that. And I just I have to say I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it keeps me. It takes me. Yeah, it motivates me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting about the. Um, if I can just sit, I know I know we're we're not we're not on to Zoo TV or Zoo Europe yet. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We can just enjoy the whole time, but. One of the things that I noticed when I was when I was working on this was if you go back to the Zoo TV indoors, uh, it's much darker than if you watch like Zoo TV live in Sydney, right? Because it's kind of like they got to Zoo Europa, things kind of lit up more, and and so it's all like much flashier and much brighter, and just kind of you know McFisto's brighter. It, 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 he's you know in his own way, but it it really is if you watch the earlier ones where it's just like. Bonner's dressed in all you know dark colors the whole time, smoking a cigarette. Mirabal Man is some you know washed up old guy, um, and it, it you just you feel so different. Even you know the the ones that were supposed to be brighter. I felt like the 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 uh, experiencing the visuals of the video, the official videos, and the things that were made. Uh, the the live performances during the Octo Baby era before Europa. It's like it it lightened up. By the time we got to the end of 1993, I don't know if anyone else has ever seen it that way, but that's what I felt. Um, Jerry, did you have something to say? I do actually. Um, and once again, knowing that you know we're not, <clears throat> we're trying not to jump ahead, but ultraviolet on the on the indoor tour was more um, him in the mirror ball man suit. Uh, acting like that televangelist preacher coming out of desire. And you had the spotlight on not only him in the mirror ball suit, but also on the uh, mirror ball trabby, trying to bring as much light into it. And I've always thought of ultraviolet as being that light that you cannot see, which is also a reference to God because God is light. You can't see God, but that it's always there, and it's and it's that bit of the rainbow that unifies um, all the colors, which Bono has also used, you know, the rainbow in um, uh, the Beautiful Day and and in other other references. So you know your um, comment about you know singing into the light of the microphone and that the microphone was red, but you got the the white mirror ball up on top. You know that that level of good versus evil, and in um, um, later in later tours, but then in '92, um, at least for the U.S. leg where we didn't have McFisto, he he was in the in the preacher outfit, uh, 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 trying to. Um, I mean, I almost saw Ultraviolet more as a confessional song. Um, more than anything else um and then on the album you confess the sin but then you can't get rid of the sin it it comes back to haunt you and sometimes that spiritual attack if you will after you confess can be sometimes even harder to try to knock off so the juxtaposition of ultraviolet with um acrobat and love is blindness on the album um to me is like that sucker one-two punch of oh Oh, you think you can be redeemed? You think you can live a normal life? Well, guess what? We're going to come after you. So that's all that I wanted to share. That's great, Sherry. Thank you. 
some really, really nice comments in the in the chat as well. I'm not sure if, uh, if I can just read out some of these because they make me feel feel really nice. Uh, and you know, I always think of okay, Edge, yeah, play the blues. Every time I see something, anything about the blues, I think of that. Um, Neil said maybe we could only say that if it was only total despair, we wouldn't sing anything at all. The fact that you two is still singing even in the darkness indicates that there is still some desire to return to life. I really, I like that. Chris said, light is brighter in the face of darkness. Yeah, that's true, because you see it. If everything's light, you would never see the light because you'd be blind, right? <laughs> um, the Thai view, the wanderer, that's interesting. The guy's very lost, but he's telling the story and so leaving the door open to a return somehow. That's really interesting. Chris said, the door is always open, no matter how small the opening, yeah. Johnny said, in trauma or how I've dealt with it, it's as if Octon Baby or Bono rather in his lyrics expresses for me what it is I felt or wished to say, which in turn helped me deal with those times. He expresses it better for me, if that makes sense. It's why I love and think it's their best album. Yeah, that's true. And that's one thing about, I think, I mean, we all, we all need different kinds of things depending on how we're feeling, you know, at a certain time and maybe we want to feel better, maybe we're feeling sad, but sometimes if, if something is dark and we're feeling dark, sometimes it helps us get it out. You have to get through it to process it, right? And and that's what I find sometimes with some of the, the things on the, the darker side of their things. Scott said, God is love, the love that is always there. You'd be like, absolutely, Scott. Neil said, light can be a beautiful comfort, but it also exposes everything. I hear sense in Octon Baby that the singer isn't quite sure he wants to be found and exposed yet because he knows where he's been and what he's done. There's a lot of tension. Yeah. Keith said, agreed, Johnny. I think this is also important in considering Ingham's comment about comfort and the connection we feel with the band and their music. Someone sees my hurt, understands it, helps me express it, and points me toward hope. Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to say, but he said it nicer than I did. Um, Chris said, Chris said, name it to tame it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Those are great comments. Um, does I, I mean, I guess, you know, it, it, you know, it's interesting how when I was listening to this album and other music as a teenager, because I'm also a huge um, Depeche Mode fan and fan of The Cure, so they're they're kind of my second and third favorite bands respectively that I never I never realized that uh, they were supposed to be you know a lot known for a lot of darker music uh, it just never occurred to me I just liked it I, and it, it I didn't realize until later until I started actually studying music more formally um, pop music and, and rock and, and, and things I, I learned in university that I just never realized it was supposed to be dark. I just thought it made me feel good. And I don't know if that's because um, I had, you know, traumatic things that happened to me early in my life. And maybe I was helping to process that and I didn't know it. But it's, it's something that, you know, just never occurred to me that these were supposed to be dark. This was not, you know, something it, that... It could be something to do with the chord sequences as well that made you feel uplifted. Unhealthy. I'm not so much about the lyrics. I don't know if I'm right in saying that or. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting watching. I think we, we talked about this some um, yesterday, or I did. Maybe it was in the in the book club party about how you know Bono writes the lyrics last, right? And and okay. Bono always says, without the music, there's no song. Like you have to have the music to have lyrics, and he writes the lyrics last around the song. And what was it was interesting was I read in um I just reread this in, in Flanagan that ultraviolet was actually the the start of what became one because they were trying to work out the music to ultraviolet and and then he he said he was you know Bono and that sort of I don't even know what to call it Johnny called it is it speaking in tongues we we're talking about that on Discord mm -hmm. sort of that you know he's kind of just saying things and. And that I've got this in my notes here somewhere where when they were rehearsing it, he, he, he said they were trying to work it out. And then the edge went away and put some things together on the piano and brought some parts back. And then 
Bono replied and said, um, is it getting better or do you feel the same? And he was actually referring to the sound of ultraviolet when they were trying to get the music to <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't about people's differences it was just like does this sound better does it still sound like crap you know it was not a <laughs> so that's, that was like one of the best things I've learned working on this talk um the other thing that I learned as well about ultraviolet this is just a fun thing we've had a lot of serious discussion here it's just kind of lighten it up a little bit I guess um if you listen to, and I, I, I went back and listened to it. I, I read this in the Songs and Experience by Niall Stokes that, that in the recording, if you, get, if you get to about three minutes and 10 seconds in, Larry dropped a drumstick on the ground. And <laughs> I didn't know that. And, and that there was a fight about whether or not to leave it in. And, but I, I think it also, I, that's kind of funny, but it, but it, it also does it like it, the song kind of, changes at that point and I I've always I've noticed that change it does feel different and maybe even lighter you know the the, the, the key changes the sounds around it change but it um I had I never would have thought that it was because Larry dropped a drumstick I just thought it was because um they, they were you know things were getting lighter by the end of the song but really it was just Larry messing up so I thought that was pretty funny um this is Eileen can you hear me okay yes yes Hey, wonderful. I just want to jump in real quick and say that, um, what, Diane, what you said a moment ago and what John said a moment ago about folks who listen to the music and maybe don't understand the undertones and how varied they can be, that's me. Um, I didn't become a fan until 2001. So the difference between their earlier albums and Octane Baby when it came out is, I appreciate it now, but it wasn't, it wasn't the physical thing for me that it is for a lot of folks. Um, so when I started listening to the music, it is, was, and is, and primarily is just the music. Um, I'm, I don't analyze lyrics as much. Um, uh, I just, I enjoy the music. Um, so hearing these discussions puts layers on songs for me that I would never have had. Um, uh, Scott, that's what the conferences do for me. They, they give folks like us the ability to see the broader picture, to have a perspective we've never had, would never have occurred to us. Um, I'm, I'm an office worker. I, I don't, these are not things that are, are on my mind a lot. And being able to hear the perspectives and the detail and the thought and the connotations, um, it's just um, a really great band that can give you music that does that. Um, so from a layperson's um, point of view, someone who just likes the music, um, this is awesome. So thanks very much, guys. That's okay. wonderful, yeah. Eileen. Thank That's you. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, well, uh, and then just say that I've, I've just attained a degree in audio production. So I've learned that there's a lot of emotion, emotional triggers with different frequencies of sound. And that is what I felt that you were getting at when we were having that discussion on the actual chord sequences and the proper way the music is structured as opposed to just the lyrics, which, has an, which is an important part of it all, but it needs, each need each other to make it a song, per se, you understand? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the great thing about in, in our next talk, we should go here so Chris can get ready, although he looks entirely ready in his signature bow tie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, you know, so he can get ready, but it, you know, hearing someone like Chris, who's a, actually a music professor, um, and then coming from all these different perspectives is one of the best things that I like about the conference because we hear all the, all the way from members of the clergy to people like me to people like Chris and you know um, people with more you know different kinds of understandings and, and sharing these perspectives is not something speaking as an academic it's not something that you get if you go to a conference that's only in your own discipline right you hear a lot of the same thing for a week and this is what's really great about sharing these perspectives so Thank you all again.